2 Corinthians 11 and Galatians 1. I want to tell you a short story as you're turning your pages. Because I saw, on my way down here yesterday, I saw the epitome of politics. This is both <laughs> I decided when I left home yesterday that I was going to come the back roads as far as I could before I got back to a highway, a, a busy highway. So I get down there somewhere in the Netherlands of East Alabama, and uh, I was on two looking for nine county roads. And I see a sign up there in the middle of the road, and it said, Road Closed, Detour, from Gravel Road. I head down this gravel road and I drove for miles and miles. I don't know. What, I thought maybe it was five or six or eight miles on this gravel road. And then is blacktop. And there's this beautiful white church right there beside where the blacktop started. So I drive a while and I'm thinking, well, I'm doing good. I'm going to back on blacktop. And I go through this little village of several houses. I go a little further. And I can see the blacktop stops. And when I got to the end of that blacktop, there was another church sitting right there. They blacktop between those two churches into their houses. That's the epitome of politics. <laughs> Ain't that something? Only in Alabama. Te Texas, on the other hand, Texas has the best roads in the nation. County, high, uh, state, everything. They have a system out there called FMs, Farm to Market Roads, and RMs, Ranch to Market Roads. And those are the best roads. The other thing they do in Texas, they don't do in any other state, near as I can tell so far, is every interstate is built with frontage roads. Mm -hmm. And the frontage roads have turnarounds. When you get to the bridge, you can just turn around, go the other direction. And it's the greatest road system the world's ever known, Texas is. Now, having said that, for the next question coming out of your mouth is, why did you leave Texas? Because I thought Alabama needed me. <laughs> <laughs> i got to stop this political stuff going on in Alabama. I'm just kidding. Hey, listen, I wrote this. You may not want a copy of it, but if you do, I, uh, it's called Reasons for Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. You can, uh, it'll start with it, make good kindling. Or whatever, it's about, uh, I think it's eight pages or something like that, and there's a lot of them in this box, so you just help yourself if you want. All right, now, I don't want to talk to you here tonight about either Galatians 1 or 2 Corinthians 11, but I want to use both of them for just a moment. 2 Corinthians 11, first of all. <clears throat> He said in verse 3, But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. And I'm amazed also at how many times we've been to Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> but he says, um, As the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now one of the things I am going to talk to you about tonight, I don't want it to sound complicated. It's not complicated. If you complicate it, it will be because you complicated it. You can't blame me. I'm not, I'm not going to complicate it. If I leave out about every sixth word, I reckon that would probably complicate it. But I hope I don't do that. Because what I'm talking about is a very simple thing. It is a very simple thing. Now look in Galatians chapter 1. Now we're not looking at simple fear about the simplicity that is in Christ. We're talking to people who did it. They left the simplicity that is in Christ. Look in chapter 1, verse 6. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. You see, the whole problem is <laughs> from one carnal church to another carnal, to a bunch of carnal churches, it happened. They left the simplicity that is in Christ. Mm -hmm. They became political and got their roads blacktopped up to their driveway. You see, the whole point I'm making is that, listen, folks, this is the way of the world. Yeah. Yeah. This is the way religion goes in the world. There are people that if we had gotten a, a, a representative from all of the churches in and around, what's this county, Covington? Covington. If you've got a, a representative from all the churches in Covington County and got them to come here tonight, 
There would have been a bunch of them that huffed and puffed and left after the first message, a bunch more after the left after this message, and I would ask for the representatives of the other churches in the county when I got up here, and not all of them be afraid to raise their hand. <laughs> because we, when we go about to not get removed from the simplicity that is in Christ, and to not pervert the gospel of Christ, we're not religious even though we're religious in our activity. We constantly preach the simple gospel of Christ. We constantly preach, don't, don't be removed from it. We're as religious as the next people, but we're not a religion. Because we don't make anything up. We don't add anything to it. And uh, uh, the messages here have been super. Uh, and i got to tell you, I have really enjoyed Brother Jan Wilburn's message this Amen. morning. Amen. In fact, Jan, if I were you, I'd get a copyright on that tape and I'd sell, I'd sell it. Put it on the marketplace. That was a really great message. It really was. Appreciate it. And uh, I was thinking about uh, uh, my message, whatever the Lord allows me to say here tonight. And I appreciate Sam putting all this up here because now I don't have to because I'm going to use some of it. But whatever the Lord allows me to go into here about my <clears throat> subject matter is by, in other words, it's by, it's by His grace, not me doing it. But it has to do with a saved individual who is, and I don't care where you're at on the timeline, that's why I love what he wrote up here and I didn't want to take it off. It's all about a saved individual who is worthy. You know, the Bible says that the scapegoat was given into the hands of a fit man. On the day of atonement, the, the, the scapegoat, Jesus Christ was our scapegoat. The scapegoat was given into the hands of a fit man. Well, I want to talk to you about the word worthy. You, who ain't worth the gunpowder take to blow you into hell. You, who are living in a fallen state and cannot do anything about it, as we've so wonderfully heard here. You, who were the subject matter of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. You and I, who don't have what it takes to serve the Lord, we who have trusted Christ as our Savior, bless your soul, we are worthy. Amen. Amen. Many times we don't want to be. We want to say, get somebody else to do it. Amen. But we forget something about that. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I know what would drive someone to be removed from the simplicity that is in Christ. I know how someone could get carried away by a perverted gospel. After I was saved, I went and did what I was raised to do. I was raised that if you trusted Christ, if you got saved, you went and joined the church and did whatever the church told you to do because after all, they were the instrument of God. So I did that. And for roughly nine years, I did everything that church told me to do. It was all wrong. The only thing good about it was some of the songs that we sang out of the choir. <laughs> Very little Bible. I taught a Sunday school class for a year of young married couples and never studied my Bible. And they thought I was a good teacher. I wasn't a good teacher. I wasn't paying any attention. I wasn't noticing what the Lord said about me. As a saved man, I wasn't paying any attention to what the Lord said about me. I found out all over again when I began to hear Brother Moore 40 years ago, January 40 years ago, I started hearing Brother Moore and I found out all over again just how unworthy I was to be saved and just exactly what the Lord had called me to do. Amen. Look in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. You are witnesses and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. 
as you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. What I'm going to talk to you about tonight is your calling. Now, I, know, I don't know that everybody in here is saved and probably wouldn't absolutely believe it if we went around here and every one of you said you were saved. I would say praise the Lord to every one of you's testimony, but that wouldn't make me necessarily believe you were all saved. But I'm going to treat you as though you're saved. Because I want to talk to you about what worthy means. If I can. Called. He said, Who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Well, bless your soul then, if you were called, unto, if you were called into the uh, kingdom of uh, RCA or the kingdom of ABC television broadcasting system, if you were called into that, don't you reckon you'd want to know, what do you want me to do here? You reckon you have any questions about, what should I do? See, I was so pig-headed as a 22-year-old after I trusted the Lord as my Savior, I decided because my daddy was a preacher, I knew what to do. And I didn't know nothing. And nine years later, I, got, I come bold-faced, right smack dab in the face with the hit from the Lord that said, Jerry, you don't know nothing. <laughs> nothing. He said that you would walk worthy of God who called you unto His kingdom and glory. How worthy do you think you walk? You know, it's interesting about that. It is not hard. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not trying to put anyone on the spot when I say this, but some of you would not want to stand up here and talk. That's it's this, it's uh, uh, the second greatest fear of people in America, really, and public speaking, standing up in front and talking. And many of you who would stand up and speak about what you know, say, you know, I I, I got a good friend who's pot. I mean, a uh, Steam, uh, what, what do you call it? Boilermaker. He can run a, uh, a or an oil refinery from a maintenance standpoint. If you got him started on that, he'd talk about that for days. Yeah, go ahead. That's good. But you ask him to give his testimony out loud and he just gets to shiver. He wouldn't want to do it. He would do it because he believed he should, but he would hate every second he was opening his mouth doing it. Because it's about the Lord. That's not the same thing as having a fear of speaking. That's a, that has to do with the reverence for the Lord. People are afraid, and I don't blame you. I'm afraid of making a mistake talking about the Lord. It's an awesome thing. It's an awesome thing. Scary. Sometimes over the last 40 years, when I've got either in with one on one, one on two, or one on 70, when I begin to talk, I get absolutely petrified. Not that I don't, I mean, I know what I'm going to say next. Generally speaking, I know what I'm going to say next, but I get petrified at the thought, what if I said that last paragraph wrong? And somebody, if somebody says, would you say that again? I say, no, don't ask me that. I don't know what I just said. <laughs> and... I, I'm getting so now, uh, more th so than uh, ever before in the last month or so, or a uh, year or so, I listen to myself on the archive. You know, I'll go, I preach on the internet and have for about three or four years. Um, and every church service that we had out there in, in Texas was a, was a Bible class that was put on the internet in the archive. And you, go, you can get about 350 of them if you got the stomach for it. <laughs> but every, anyway... I go back and listen to a lot of those now because I have a harder time remembering what I said. And I found it very helpful to go back and listen to myself because I sometimes have to get up and say, I need to correct something here. And also it keeps you from repeating yourself as much, you know, <laughs> so far it does. The whole point I'm making, folks, is that there is a worthiness that you carry with you because you belong to Him that I want you to understand. Amen. You see, here's the thing. He called you. Look in Ephesians 4. The Lord did this call. You didn't do it. You trusted Christ when you heard the gospel of Christ. You heard that Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He was raised for your justification. Someone told you that all your sins were forgiven. Someone showed 
that it's called preaching. Someone showed you that that fit you, that that was for you, that you were, you needed that. Someone did that. I don't care if it's one person or seven thousand people did that. I don't know how many people I heard preach that. I sang it in songs when I was a kid. I used to sing about all my sins being forgiven, and then wonder why they would have a twenty minute altar call. Yeah. If all my sins are forgiven, why am I going to go to this altar? Amen. And all on and on. The night that I got saved, I didn't confess one single sin. Couldn't have even thought of one, probably. And I remember more than anything else, that, that, like I thought about this when Brother Sam mentioned uh, what he said to the Lord and how, how uh, doctrinal it was. What I said was, Oh Lord, I'm a mess. Yeah. Please save me. I don't give a flip what that matches or doesn't match about doctrine. Bless Amen. your soul. He was the Lord. I was the sinner. He saved me. Amen. Amen. Now here's the thing. He did the calling from the time you first heard that Christ died for your sins. And you might have heard that in a Catholic church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even though it would have been so skewered and messed up and fouled up, it would have done you any good. But you still might have heard it there. I heard it in a separate Baptist church and they believe the strangest set of doctrine. You know why they're called separate? Because they know other Baptists have anything to do with them. <laughs> True. But bless your soul, let me tell you something. I know I heard Jesus Christ died for my sins. My brother Jack would tell you he never heard it. Well, I did. Yeah. And I would have conversations with people, with kids in my class at school because we never... Uh, we never went to the churches in our, in our hometown. We, my dad was always preaching somewhere else. And these other churches were, you know, Beth, uh, Methodist and uh, Nazarene and, and um, uh, Disciples of Christ. That, or, yeah, Disciples of Christ. All that kind of thing. But I would have conversations with, the, with kids in school. And I would talk about with them about Jesus, who Jesus was. And they would always, always look at me like I was crazy if I said something about, you can lose your salvation. Even the Methodist kids back in the 50s, the Methodists didn't automatically preach that you could lose your salvation. Now they preach you don't know. <laughs> but the point, is, the point I'm making about that is we talked about this. Oh, I remember talking about Jesus a lot. So, well, what did you know? I have the foggiest idea what I knew. But the night I got saved, I knew he was the Savior. I knew he could save me. I knew that one verse, whosoever should call upon the name of the Lord should be saved. So I said those words based upon that verse. If somebody dispensationally argues with me about that, I say, so what? I trusted Christ as my Savior. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing now. In Ephesians 4.1, notice what he says. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, by now he is a prisoner of the Lord for the whole of, of the body of Christ. Amen. Paul is a prisoner of the Lord for the whole of the body of Christ. Why? Because that's who he's writing to. Ephesians is the last book that Paul wrote to a group of people. Last one. It's the 12th book he wrote. <clears throat> Second Timothy is the 13th book that he wrote. He says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you, like the epitome of everybody that's in the church the body of Christ. You couldn't get more doctrinal than the book of Ephesians. He says, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. Amen. Vocation implies work. Yeah. You know, there are people that think grace preachers should never mention work. Our apostle mentioned work more than he mentioned salvation. Amen. You know why? Because he wrote 13 epistles Nine of them he wrote to groups of people just like this group of people. And all of them he wrote to them as though they were saved. So did he believe they were saved? It didn't make any difference. That's how he wrote to them. He wrote to them as saved individuals. Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. He did the calling. You've got the vocation. And I'm probably talking to some people here who've got the foggiest idea of what vocation you might have. I fully understand that. And 40 years ago when I heard Brother Moore the first time, I was astounded. I was astounded how much Bible I saw in the first two or three Bible classes. I was astounded that I, he was like my dad. He believed the King James Bible was the Word of God, but he told us why. Yeah, Stuff true. Sam did up here and some other things like that. And my father believed the King James Bible was the Word of God, but he never told anybody why. I don't know why he did that. Maybe he didn't know how to. 
But nevertheless, I began to see that. I began to see why was it that I could trust the, the King James Bible. I remember a day not very long down the road, five, four or five months, maybe six, and maybe after I quit the Baptist Church, I'm not sure. But I remember coming to a conclusion in my mind. It was as clear as the night that I got saved. I believed this book. Amen. About uh, five years later, I mean, I started preaching. I decided I was called to preach, you know, about eight months after I heard Brother Moore. And um, and I started just preaching here and there. And in a couple of years, I was preaching some more. And then a couple more years, and I was pastoring uh, the Selma Church, Berean Bible Church in Selma. And uh, uh, sometime during there, I hit a, a kind of a low that I wouldn't have the foggiest idea how to describe to you how low that was. It just looked like blackness to me. And it looked like everything I was doing was a failure. Everything I was doing was, was uh, of the devil and not of the Lord. And yet all the time I'm trying to hold up the Bible and say that I believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. I believe in rightly dividing the Word of truth. And I believe in salvation by grace. And on and on and on. All those basic doctrines, you know. I was trying to do all of that. And yet my, my spirit, my mo my moral, my, my morale, all of that was just as low. Uh, it was so low that uh, it, if I'd have had a top hat on, I could have slid under a snake. <laughs> you see, the whole point I'm making about that, folks, is that that had nothing whatsoever to do with my salvation nor my calling. It had everything to do with what kind of a guy I was. Yeah. Right here and right here and on and on and on. Yeah. It had to do with a lot with what I thought life had cheated me out of and things like that. You ever get to feel sorry for yourself? There you go. Well, all of a sudden, there was a day. I was walking down the road, uh, a street in Mobile. I remember it well. It was Michael Boulevard. And I was walking down this street. I felt as alone as I could possibly feel. And I said, Lord, I'm not quitting. Nothing changed. You know what the Lord said? Absolutely nothing. I walked a little further and I said, and Satan, out loud, I said this. I said, and Satan, if you think you can stop me, why don't you just pour it on? <coughs> Satan didn't say anything either. <laughs> I walked a little further. And I said, what do I do now, Lord? And it was almost like the street lit up. I didn't have any words. I never saw anything strange. I just knew everything was going to be all right. Yeah. It took a while, about two years, to make everything all right. But I never wavered from what the Lord said in here. He didn't say anything to me on Michael Boulevard. But when I said to the Lord, what do I do now? He became the leader. He became the leader. Was I walking worthy of the vocation? Nah. Did I understand the vocation? Nah. Was I going to understand the vocation? Yeah. Pretty quick. Then, you know, the devil decided he would turn it on. And all hell did break loose. But you know, we, our spirit never broke again. When I say our, I, I had an infected Barbara <coughs> with all of that. She could tell the difference. I never told her about the walk down Michael Boulevard for years. But she could see the difference. And it was a struggle. It was worth every step of the struggle. It was worth it all to say. We finally, we were living uh, in a building <coughs> that we were forced into because the house flooded and lost about everything we owned in the house flood. We're living in a building <coughs> that the owners quit paying the electricity bill and the electricity went off in the building. We were, we were there as a substitute for high insurance. We didn't pay any rent. 
And when the utilities went off, I called a friend of mine at the power company and I said, Bobby, can I get these lights turned back on? He says, oh, no, Jerry, you can't. He said, but he owes us $8,900, and the only way you can turn it back on is if you paid it. <laughs> I, was, I was getting about somewhere in the neighborhood of three or $400 a month at that time. Total. So we stayed there five months with no electricity in Mobile in the summertime. That's quite a story. You don't even want to know all that detail, so I won't bother you with it, but I can tell you this much. When it was over, and the Lord graciously led us out of that, we could, we believe we could charge hell with a water bucket after all that. <laughs> <laughs> now, why did he call us? He wasn't fooling around. He wasn't fooling around. The gifts and calling of God are what? Without repentance. You know something that you ought to know about that? When the Lord calls you by His grace and you stand in that grace, you belong to Him. You're His. He's yours, but you're His. And He called you. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? I mean, look at me. Come on, look at me. Can you imagine the Lord wanting to call me? No, I can't. I just accept it. I just accept it. I find it phenomenally interesting that the Lord has allowed me to even speak His name for the last 40 years. Let alone ever how many years I've got left. I don't even care how many years there are left. But let me tell you something. I know that He called me and it was His idea. Before the foundation of the world, over here, He chose me to come into uh, 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 a turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Come into a situation where his son, who's going to die for me here, be buried, be raised again from the dead, and because of, he was going to give that message to the guy named Paul, and some were 1942 years later, uh, I was going to get born in 1900 and, and um, uh, uh, I can't do math. Uh, in 1964, I was going to trust Christ as my Savior, and in 2014, I'm going to stand here and tell you about it. He knew all that from way back there, and He gave me to His Son anyway. Yeah, yeah. Amen. That's good. Worthiness. Worth something. Worthy is worth something. means worth something. It calls on us to walk a certain way. Amen. Why? Because the Lord's not fooling around. The Lord's dead serious. The question is, are you serious with the Lord? I told you 1 Corinthians 1, didn't I? Okay. Go there. The reason I want you to consider this is because I bet you haven't today. Maybe you have, but bet you have. First Corinthians chapter one, verse three: Grace be unto you, and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. That in everything you are enriched by Him in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Now that makes the individual who has done all, who has received all of this, it makes him look like he's worthy. It says the grace came. Its enrichment came, verse 5. All utterance and all knowledge came your way. And the, verse uh, 6, the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you. So there ain't no doubt about the testimony of Christ being confirmed in you. Right? If the preacher's preaching the gospel of Christ here uh, since last night, have they made you nervous or have they confirmed the testimony of Christ in you? Which is it? Amen. Keep reading so that you come behind in no gift. Well, that ought to make you worthy. Look at the things the Lord just gave you in three verses there that ought to fulfill every requirement He would ever have for you to be worthy. And He don't shut up there. He just keeps going. Look at the next verse. So, verse 7, so that you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall also confirm you unto the end. That's good to know. Amen. Amen. Look at all the things He's given you and in effect sort of added casually that He's going to confirm you with all of that clear unto the end. And then He says that you may be blameless 
in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all ready to go? You want to go tomorrow and see how blameless you are? Now here's the biggie. This is why we came. Next verse. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the fellowship of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Have you thought of yourself since you got here? I know you thought about the fellowship with the saints. It's marvelous. It's wonderful to be here with you. Did you think about fellowship with Jesus? Fellowship with Jesus. Well, you got here by the gospel. But it was that sealed with the Holy Spirit that, that uh, Brother Lynn brought up that's kept you here. It's kept you right there in the sweet fellowship of God's Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Sing with me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. How I love Jesus because he first loved me. Take a deep breath. Okay, now you're woke, awakened and you can go through the rest of the service. Don't fall asleep. You see, I, 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 knew about, I know about being last. <laughs> Look, look if you will in um, look if, if you will in Romans chapter one. I see. No, 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 no. Uh, turn to Colossians one. Then you won't have to uh, leave Colossians. Uh, you can just look in Colossians one. What we're talking about is the how, the who, the why, and the what. Concerning the calling of the Lord. The Lord does the calling. The Lord doesn't fool around. He's not doing it by accident. He knows whom he called. But nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. The Lord knoweth. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Amen. 2 Timothy 2.19. All right. In Colossians chapter 1, he says, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet, which is worthy, apt, fit, able, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Listen to me. The worthiness that you have, which you gain, which is noticeable to you. The worthiness that you have is due to the fact that the Lord God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ has called you into the fellowship of His Son, given you over into His kingdom, put a seal upon you to keep you there, <coughs> left you in a world that will rip you to shreds and dro drop you into the deepest ditch it can find and swallow you around in mud until you got so much muck on you that you stink to high heaven and all of those kinds of things go on in your life and bless your soul that has nothing to do with your fellowship with the Lord. Amen. He called you to it. He put you in it. God Almighty is in charge of that. Amen. He called you into it. He put you in it. And it's there. The question is what do you do about it? Did you know that Paul praying that you might be filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding does not mean that you are filled with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding? Mm -hmm. Just because Paul prayed that doesn't mean it at all. You know that one verse that we hang our hat on has to do with study? Well, guess what? You can't substitute. That's 
right. You can't substitute for study. You will never know. People say, I've had people come to my office and say, I'm trying to figure out the will of God for my life. And I say, okay. And they say, well, can you help me? I say, no. <laughs> They'll come to Bible class. 18-year-old come into my office one time. He said, I'd like to talk to you about the will of God for my life. And I said, okay. And he just kind of sat there. I said, uh, did, did you expect me to say something about it? He says, well, I guess I want... I guess I'd kind of like to know, how, how do I know? I said, I haven't the foggiest idea. He <laughs> said, oh. And I said, do you want to go to Bible class with me? Well, he says, uh, I've been to a lot of Bible classes. And I said, well, probably not enough, since you don't know what the will of God is for your life. <clears throat> and since I can't, obviously I can't tell you. I think you ought to go to some more Bible classes. If you don't want to go to mine, I said, I've got Scott Mitchell's over here about 17 miles away. And uh, Brother Dick Maller teaches a Bible class over here on Thursday night. No, no, he says, I, uh, I, I didn't mean that. And I said, well, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I'm saying, you want to know the will of God for your life, you're going to have to get into the Word. <laughs> I said, how many hours a week are you studying the Bible now? He wouldn't even answer me. I said, you can't know the will of God for your life unless you go to see what the boss said. Mm -hmm. yeah. I said, is he your savior? Yeah. If you worked for a man, do you think you'd ask him what did he want you to do? And would he tell you anything? And he says, yeah. And I said, well, you don't work for me, do you? I'm not going to tell you. So he went to Bible class with me. And we got in the car in New Braunfels and we drove 180 miles to a Bible class in the Woodlands over north of Houston to a Bible class. And we go in there, we sit down. I always went there in time for dinner. Those folks are very gracious. It's Brother Steve Gottberg, who now preaches in Austin, Texas now. And I was at his house, and we went in and sat down to have dinner. And we sat there a few minutes, and Steve and I and his oldest daughter were talking about uh, someone had gotten saved at her school. She went to a Christian school, someone had gotten saved. So we were talking about individual salvation. And I never thought anything about this. Boy gets up and walks away from the table. I thought, oh, go to the bathroom or something. He comes back in in a few minutes. He sits down, and when the break in the conversation came, he said, I need to tell you something. I just got saved. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So we said, well, tell us about it. We all praised the Lord with him and said, tell us about it. He said, well, he said, I was raised to be a believer, and I thought I was saved, and he goes through the whole testimony, and he tells about he was listening to... Uh, the, the things that the girl had said about this person in school and the things, the comments that Steve and I made about true salvation and so, and so forth. And the second daughter had entered into the conversation on it. And he said, he said, and there was a pot spot there where I just knew I was lost. So he got saved. And it wasn't long until he said, he went to several more Bible classes with me and he found a girl. He was about... By that time, he's about 19 or so. He found a girl. He dated this girl for a while, and they got married, and so on and so forth. I asked him one day, I said, still got it settled in your mind about what is the will of God for your life? And he said, oh, yeah, I do. He said, I grew up believing I ought to be a preacher. He said, there ain't no way I'm going to stand up and be a preacher. He said, I get my testimony everywhere I go, and I witness to people all the time. He said, I'm going to be a preacher. I said, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. He said, did you notice... <clears throat> my grandmother at my graduation? I said, yeah. He said, she's still angry. He said, what would you make of that? The reason she's angry is because she had claimed for <coughs> years that she had led this little grandson at age five or six, that she had led him to the Lord. And then he got saved at 18 and made her angry. He said, what would you make of that? I said, if I were you in your shoes, I would tell Grandma every chance I got. I would repeat my testimony. I'd tell her again and again. Yeah. He said, you don't think she's saved, do you? I said, it was not up to me. And why would a grandmother get angry when her grandson got saved? Yeah. Amen. Just because it took some glory from her? She wasn't in this anyway, was she? Right. Amen. Amen. Now, my point about that was, you can't know how work, what, what the vocation is that you've got in the Lord. And you can't walk worthy of it 
just because there's some words that use that are used in the Bible to imply that you do or can. Because it takes what these people did for that. Study to show thyself approved unto God. He said, uh, look back in 1 Thessalonians. Hold on to Colossians 1. Look back in 1 Thessalonians. just one or two pages over again in chapter 3. Verse 5. For this cause when I could no longer... Um, I did say 1 Thessalonians, didn't I? Yes. 3, 5. For this cause when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. But now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith and charity and that you have good remembrance of us always, desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. Why would Paul say that? Because he found out how much faith these people had. Found out what they were continuing on with. Timothy had given a good report. Well, we don't do that sort of thing in the same sense of put, building it into a ledger sheet the way Paul did there in 1 Thessalonians 3. But we do have a reckoning about it. Individually and collectively as, of a, as a church or as uh, different congregations or Bible classes spread around the country. We do have a sort of a reckoning about it all. You know how? Our faithfulness shows up. Look in Colossians 2. <clears throat> Colossians 2 verse 2 last line of verse 1 as many as have not seen my face in the flesh and Paul's writing this to people he didn't know that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Do you realize that the acknowledging, acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, is something that is absolute uh, of an absolute necessity to be acknowledged on a daily basis, on a weekly basis? When you walk into... Anybody let David's here? When you walk into Percy Peters' uh, Bible class uh, Sunday morning or wherever he has the other one, your house is it? Where's he have the other one? Yeah. Yeah, and I pray. Okay. When he when he walk you walk in there and he says something, he picks up the Bible. Are you going to have any wonder in your mind about whether or not he's faithful to the Word of God? You're not going to worry about him being faithful, are you? No. In other words, you're going to see that he's faithful, right? Ah, uh -huh. how people see y'all. The reason I say that about Percy is because I've been on Percy a long, long time. But he talked about that night that I threw the pen up in the air and it hit the ceiling. You know, that's a really heavily popcorn ceiling. All that loose stuff. And a bunch of it comes floating down. Percy Peter said, I'm going to have to get this or this whole ceiling is going to fall in. <laughs> Literally, when you looked around at the rest of that house, you wondered if the whole thing was going to stand there very long. But nevertheless, that was not the case. It was a well-built house. But anyway, it, it, that's what he was talking about when he was referring to it. You see, the point I'm making, though, is that Percy did get it. He saw it. He saw the truth of God's Word. And he's been faithful ever since. Do you realize that you're looking at a man, 78 years old, who, even though he taught Sunday school classes of little things that he knew and whatever earlier on in his life, he realized that his job, he worked for Scott Paper Company. Just, just plain old work. A great preacher does not have to be trained as a preacher. Amen. He has to be trained by the Word of God. Amen. It's great that some men are so orderly that they can get everything done that they get up to do. But that's not what makes them a great preacher. Adherence to the Word of God makes Amen. them a great preacher. Now, Colossians chapter 2, verse uh, 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. You know what? I was preaching to an individual one day in the YMCA in downtown Mobile. I was standing there talking to him one-on-one -on -one about the gospel of Christ and about rightly dividing. The only way you can see the gospel of Christ is by rightly dividing because there are several gospels in the Bible. And I was really just laying it out to him. And he was listening and he was serious and whatever. 
And I, you know, he had to leave and I had to leave. And so we parted company and I walk over to another part of the Y and a man followed me over there. And he said, say, I heard you talking to that young man there. And I'd like to talk to you about that for a moment. I said, oh, okay. I thought, oh, hey, another opportunity. He says, you know, uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, somewhat of a, an officer in our church and we need something in our church and you might fit the bill. I said, what's that? He said, we need more pastors. I said, you want me to be a pastor in your church? He said, I believe you'd fit right in. I said, what church is it? And he said, it's the Roman Catholic Church. <laughs> <laughs> I said, what did you hear me say that made you think? <laughs> he says, well, I really couldn't go into the detail of it, but we just need preachers. And he said, let me tell you. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, I'm a married man. Got kids. He said, oh, we don't care about that. We can fit you in. He said, we're getting Episcopal guys that's got married and got seven or eight kids going to be priests in our church. I said, you pulled my leg. And he said, no, I'm not. I said, let me tell you what I believe. Oh, he says, we'll fix that. <laughs> <laughs> Lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. I know what he wanted me to ask next. What's the pay? The Lord led me away, thank God. <laughs> Look at 1 Thessalonians again, chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse, uh, verse 1. Furthermore then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as you have received of us, how you ought to walk and to please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. You ought to read Paul's word, Paul's verses, where he used the word commands or commandments. Or command, singular. Just look up that. You can do that on your computer tonight before you go to bed. It won't take long. Romans to Philemon, command, asterisk. It'll get you all the word. Command, commands, and commandments. A commandment and commandments. It'll get them for you. Read them. Paul laid down some commandments to the church. People pay attention to what he did. He's dead serious. Amen. God's not frivolous about anything. Look at verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Now the next two or three verses is all about that. Think about it. Do not think about it simply as sex outside of marriage. Think about it as fornication. Fornication is an idolatrous practice that has everything to do with sensuality, not simply sexuality. Look it up carefully. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel, that has to do with your body, in sanctification and honor, not in the lust of concupiscence. Concupiscence is like things that you know you shouldn't have. Um, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Why all the emphasis on fornication? Go back to chapter 1. Here's why. Here's what these people did. Verse 9, For they themselves showed us what manner of entering in we had unto you. Now watch. And how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven. What was their problem? Idolatry. What's the problem with fornication? It's filled with idolatry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> did y'all ever see anything called the Church on the Rock from Virginia <coughs> several years ago on television? It was a fat little pear-shaped preacher and his beautiful wife, who had a voice a little bit like this, a little lower than this. I don't think I can get that low. That's the way they did it. He would come out and prance. And I ain't pulling your leg. He would take a hold of his coattails. Well, there's a war coat tonight. And he'd go like this. And he would prance around. And women would come. This was in the, this was in the 80s, maybe. And Dan Skin. Danskin? You women know what Danskin is? Yeah. It's skimpy dance uniforms and undergarments and all that. Danskin 
was big into the dance uniforms of the day, and women would come out of that audience in dance skins and dance with that fat man all across the front of that pulpit. And then his wife would come out and preach the message. <laughs> That's called fornication, folks. I don't give a flip whether there was any sex going on or not. And frankly, after I looked at that man, I couldn't have imagined that anybody would ever want to have sex with him. <laughs> But it was still fornication. It was an abomination in the sight of God, and it was on television every Sunday night. Yeah, amen. What a mess. What a mess. Why did we get into this mess? Why is it such a mess? I can tell you why. It's three words in your Bible. It's the word freely, liberty, and grace. Nobody thinks of those words as bearing responsibility. <coughs> they only think of those words as it fits them and their mood at the moment. Look at uh, Galatians chapter 5. <coughs> Galatians 5. Verse 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and most people stop, most people whose mind is centered on them, themselves stop right there. They don't look at why the Lord caused Paul to write that. The rest of the verse says and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. In chapter 4 the yoke of bondage is religion. So what do you use the liberty for? To be free from religion. Look down, if you will, verse uh, um, 13. For brethren, you've been called unto liberty. Everybody loves that. But how about the rest of it? Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Do you realize that if love causes you to serve another person, if love causes you to serve, I don't care if it's husband or wife, if love causes you to serve another person, that there isn't anything sensual about it. Right. Mm -hmm. A man who loves his wife the way Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that man will not look for the sensuality or the sexuality when he serves his wife. If you have to think about that a while, go right ahead and think about it. <laughs> but let me tell you something. A woman knows that intuitively if she's had children. Because she has done that for that baby <coughs> from the day he was born. And if she gets deprived of that, she gets she goes she goes inward. In other words, if she has a child that something happens to the child, or for some reason the child is taken from her, or whatever. She will go in, introvert. Uh, she'll go in, introspective on that, and she'll get. Um, um, she, she'll be less than fulfilled. Why? Because it's an instinct that God given to her. She be saved in childbearing. Again, point that out. And and what I'm saying to you about that is that men don't have that. Men have to learn that. Sometimes men see it in their father, and they become very good, at it, very natural acting that like that. But most of the time, it has to do with. Loving your wife the way Christ loved the church out of Ephesians 5. It has nothing to do with the natural order of things. Naturally, we are, um, we are a lot more um, volatile than that. Me and I. So it's not natural. We're, oh, wait a minute. We're not supposed to be natural men. We're supposed to be spiritual men. And that does include you ladies. Now notice. Look at... Um, uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out which is the best. Uh, turn, turn to what we'll set you right close to. Go to Ephesians 2. <clears throat> Verse 8. And every one of you know this verse. In fact, you know seven, you know eight and nine both. Because ever since you first went to the rightly divided Bible class, somebody's been either reading this to you or reading it with you or quoting it to you. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But you, they didn't read you verse 10. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. You see, if God called you by His grace and stood you, it's in His grace that you stand, and He stood you there, if it remains grace, He will never compel you to do anything. He never will. You know why? Because He saved you by His grace. That's right. If you owe Him anything, it wasn't grace. That's right. That's good. Now that's the whole deal. That's the whole deal. But that doesn't touch the instructions that God gave to Paul about all those people saved by grace and what they should do. Mm -hmm. That doesn't even touch that. That's the surface of it. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, you know, it's very difficult to, for me to believe that I've been here sitting here listening to eight. This is the eighth, I think, class. And one person, I think, or maybe two, has quoted out of 2 Corinthians 5, but nobody's read it. It's hard to get through a Bible conference without 2 Corinthians 5. Notice verse 15. For the love of Christ constraineth us. You could almost, not perfectly, but you could almost substitute the word compel. If the love of Christ constraineth us, it is the love of Christ, the love that Christ had for us, the love that was in association with what Christ did for us. It's that love that would constrain, which means to press through or pull through. It's the love of Christ, His love for you, that would compel you to think there was something you should do. Love of Christ, love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that He died for all, that henceforth we should not henceforth live unto ourselves, unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Have you thought about that? What compels you? What pushes you forward? What draws you into the service of the Lord? I was age 24, and a lady about 40 at the time asked Barbara and I, who we were into singing at that time, we sang a lot in church. She asked us at what point we thought we would be in full time service to the Lord. And simultaneously, and without thinking about it, we both laughed out loud. <laughs> we never had any thoughts of being in full-time service to the Lord. In the first place, we were going to church, which probably would have told we had to go to college to do that. No, we hadn't thought about that. We went into <clears throat> full-time service for the Lord without ever thinking about it again. But the Lord... And his love for us compelled us, constrained us. How can we keep our mouths shut? How can we not take in these people? I once called Barbara, stopped at the filling station about five miles from home. I said, called Barbara. I said, Barbara, what do we got for supper? And she said, a beef stew. She said, Bobby and so-and-so is coming over. Jack is here. We've got beef stew. I said, water it down and make it beef soup. I'm bringing home three guys with me. <laughs> she said, who's these three guys? I said, I don't know. I picked them up on the road. They're all three hungry. Barbara put up with that. I don't even want to tell you what all she's put up with. But you see what? You, you know why she did? She didn't do that for Jerry's sake. She wasn't trying to make Jerry look good. She did it because it was the thing to do. We were talking to those boys. I was talking to those boys, and I knew that with Bobby was another preacher. And Jack and I, were, we were going to all talk to those boys about the Lord. And Barbara knew that. Say, I bet she never thought of it. I bet she did. You can ask her. She'll remember it well. <coughs> I get home, and Bobby and his wife were already there, and Jack and Bobby were out in the driveway shooting baskets with my two boys, Steve and Brian. I pulled in in a van, and these guys get started unloading out of the van. <laughs> Jack and Bobby said, what is this? I said, this is your project for the evening. <laughs> you see, folks, if something doesn't compel you, draw you into the service of the Lord because of the love of Christ, then stay out of it. There you go. That's good. Amen. That's Fouled up enough the way it is. Yeah. One more passage. Cannot do this without this passage. Then I'll shut up. I promise. First Corinthians chapter one again. This one breaks my heart. This absolutely breaks my heart. 
verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. <coughs> speak the same thing. No divisions. Perfectly joined together. Same mind. Same judgment. How well we do it. Ain't that a mess? Ain't we a mess? But it never changes the calling. It never changes who we are in Christ. Amen. Amen. When we left Texas, we sang one verse of Bless Me the Tie That Binds. Hard to do. We all know the tie that binds. The tie that binds, I, I grew up believe I'd hear that song about once a year from some gathering of separate Baptist people, knowing that they're all going to go back and be separate for the rest of the year. <laughs> I would hear that and I'd think, oh, it's because they love one another. Well, it is, but that's not it. The tie that binds is the word of Christ which dwells in us. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly into all wisdom. It's the word of Christ. What ties us together can be family bonds, it can be fellowship, it can be a great affinity towards certain people. If you go to a lot of Bible conferences, you'll find yourself looking for the face of certain people when you go, oh, there she is, oh, there he is. And you're glad to see them. But the tie that binds is the word of Christ. Amen. The tie that binds is what the Lord gave us. The Lord gave all of us. You know, I remember a tie that bound me to David Zabendon's dad. How long has your dad been gone? 16 years. I was only around him three or four times. But there was some affinity that was there. And the times that I saw him, it was so pleasing for me to go up and shake hands with him because we had a, we had a same thing about the word of Christ that dwelt in this boat. He chewed me out once for something I said in a sermon. It didn't make any difference to me at all about the affinity toward him. Do you know he did that, Dave? Well, it doesn't surprise you, does it? <laughs> <laughs> You see, my point about all that is, folks, is this is who we are. And the Lord called us anyway. He called us anyway. He called us anyway. Isn't that marvelous? Doesn't it make you feel great to know that you belong to the Lord, that He is yours, that you are His, and He called you under this because, before the foundation of the world, and He gave you all this stuff, and, he, and he's, he's noticing, he, he notices what we do. He notices how untogether we are. But he doesn't change his mind. He keeps us. He keeps us. I hope you have a great night of rest. <coughs> tomorrow.